Good evening, everybody. And uh, so uh, a slight change to, to the topic. So we're discussing pachypodium as one group of fat plants. Uh, can everybody hear me, I guess? Yes. Uh, Vlad, everything yep. is clear, yep. right? Okay. Yep. So as we start, uh, the one thing I wanted to suggest to people, this is a group of plants that was really dear to me but I've almost had to completely give up growing these um, plants. And the reason I've had to do that is primarily because I've never had the best conditions for growing, especially the Madagascan pachypodiums. I still have some South African pachypodiums that have been going on for many years. Uh, but the Madagascans are really hard to keep. Now that we are able to get, and we have, I mean, most people in the club were able to get some pumice, I would start to encourage people to start looking at growing these plants again. They are just fabulous. Uh, uh, almost like Adenium, maybe a little bit harder, especially the Ma Madagascans. So, Basically, here they are. Uh, you all can see the list. These are the names of most of them. There's probably a few changes that have been made to these over the years. But by and large, uh, this is the list of pachypodiums. Now, some of these are aborescent types. And uh, those are really too big for most of us to grow in our homes because for them to flower, they probably got to reach sizes of six to eight feet at the earliest. Uh, so it's much better to look at the more compact forms, the more tacky call uh, types with the, the true codex. So here we go. We start with firstly the African species and you can see here that it is mostly in the southern part of Africa that these species grow. Bispinosum, Lelii, Lelii, Lelii sondersi, Namaquanum, and Succulenta. Really beautiful uh, varieties, but you can see that they're so spread out in the African continent. This is the Madagascan. So one thing I wanted to say about Pachypodium, they're endemic only to Africa. You do not find Pachypodium anywhere else in the world. There is no other species of Pachypodium. Uh, so Everything is either in the southern part of Africa or on the island of Madagascar. The Madagascan pachypodiums are just the ultimate. Uh, when, when I started collecting, when I came to Canada, it was much easier to find pachypodium. So even the stuff like Baranai and Windsorii, um, which are the red flowering varieties, we could actually get some plants in Canada. So Sorensen's used to bring it in and uh, there was actually a few plants that you could find. Now it is almost impossible unless somebody was growing them from seed. So this is one, uh, one group and here's another group of it. I'm not going into the details of every the, the, where they are growing and which varieties, but we'll start talking about growing, uh, which varieties are really the best to grow. So here's the, the, the genus Pachypodium div divided into groups. Uh, so we have the Pachycol, the Seriform, the Shrubby Pachycol, the cordiciform and the cactiform. So the cactiform, there's only really one variety, which is brevicol. And in the cordiciform, the true cordiciform, as they consider it, it is only uh, 
bispinosum and succulentum. In the shrubby pachycol, you have densiflorum, arumbens, hibernium, rosulatum, ambogans, decari, uh, baroni, lelii. I don't know why they actually included lelii because it's, it's really quite, uh, anyways, it, it's the way they've included it. And so namaquanum is a seriform. It's just a it looks like a big baseball bat. And then you have the gai, hibernium, and lamari, which are the tree-like pachycols. Okay, they're very, uh, uh, so I call those arborescent types. And then the, the flower shapes, uh, they've been divided into roughly four, but the flower shapes are quite different among some of the varieties. So um, anyway, uh, we won't, really discuss each flower in detail. But just like adenium flowers, to pollinate them, uh, the insect has to have a long proboscis to go inside. Uh, so if you had to do it by hand, you'd really have to open up the flower and use, they use a horse's hair or a very, very fine brush and you take the pollen and pollinate the plant. Anyway, that's just by the by. So here we've got the difference between the species. Uh, so far, is everybody following well enough? Yep. Okay. So you've got the African species and the Madagascan species. Now, the only reason we've listed it as African species, it really should be South African species because they're all African species. Madagascar is part of Africa. So uh, now, uh, just by the by, this was a presentation I did. I can't exactly remember the exact date. Dave, what was the date? Do you remember? Don't remember it. Okay, but this was many, many years ago, and this was a presentation I did before, you know, we, we had the, the ease of getting slides and being able to take pictures on our phones, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I didn't really expect to do this presentation uh, at this point because we were supposed to have our auction today, but with, uh, with the TBG increasing the fees so high, we weren't. Uh, we thought it best not to do the auction. So I'm presenting this. Uh, but I think most of the club would, would not even remember this presentation. And it's been that long. Anyway, so African, uh, the South African species, the spines are long, narrow-based, and they're circular. Is that the right pronunciation? Okay. Inflorescence is compact never long pedunculate. And corolla is white, pink, or flushed with striped or, or striped with purple. Nectar scales inconspicuous. And on the Madagascan species, the spines are short to conical and broad base. Inflorescence is compact or short or long pedunculate. The corolla is a white, yellow, or red. So there is no pink uh, with the Madagascan species. And the nectar scales are well developed. Here's a, a picture of uh, the variety of flowers. Now, uh, not uh, these are actually, they're supposed to represent the actual size of the flowers. So uh, for instance, uh, R is densiflorum, densiflorum. And the flower size is quite small as compared to densiflorum brevicalix, which is Q uh, at the bottom left. So the flower size that really make the difference. While the flowers look almost the same, it's the flower size that shows you it's a different variety. Okay, so here we go. And uh, we, we start to, to just show off 
uh, the plants as they are. So Densiflorum, a really beautiful plant, very slow growing and uh, short spine. To the right, you can see the juvenile form. And uh, at the juvenile form, it's very easy to mix up with horumbens. Um, so most people are really confused at that size. But the reason I did the juvenile and the mature is so that you can see the difference. Now, the one on the left, my left, is probably a plant that was collected because you can see that the spines are absent from the main cortex or the main trunk of the plant. They're just spines on the top. If you grew that in habitat, in a greenhouse or at home, you'd have spines all over the plant. So here we are, more mature specimens. You can see that the spination is much thinner now because uh, these are both plants that would have been grown from seed uh, in people's collections. And so you can see the whole body, most of the body is covered with the spines. Um, the leaf is easy to see. The underside is more like a, a lighter color and the outside is dark. So it's almost like a very pale green on the underside of the leaf. And it's quite a stiff, thick leaf. Those are the flowers, uh, really beautiful and uh, amazing. But the one thing is these will flower only once in a season. It's very rare to find a plant that will flower more than once in a season. So here's the next one, which is Densiflorum brevicalix. Um, and as you can see, they don't look very much different from the earlier Densiflorum. Remember what I said, only the flower is different and it's more the size of the flower than anything else. So there they are, uh, more mature specimens and you can see the spines covering the whole body of the plant. Now, when I got these pictures, uh, they were describing that plant. So we just have to take it, assume that they are the right uh, pachypodium. Now, a lot of pachypodiums, uh, if grown in habitat, will have this basal branching uh, look to them. The one on the extreme left is very, it's very unusual to have them grow with the side branching coming out much later. So you can see the flower is a bit different. Um, I'm just going to go back to the flower of Densiflorum Densiflorum. This is Densiflorum Breve Calyx. Whoops. Okay, so that is the Densiflorum flower. And we're going back to the Brevicalyx. So it's a bigger flower than the Densiflorum, but it's a little slightly narrower petals. Any questions at this point? Okay. So now we go to, the, to what I consider one of the best, um, they call this the cow pie pachypodium. This pachypodium brevicol is a cactiform, uh, described as the cactiform. It is very, it grows very low to the ground and um, you could get some plants that could be even almost two feet across. Uh, very old, but those are only in habitat. I mean, I don't think anybody has that large a plant in their collections, unless it's a botanical garden. So there is a mature one and uh, 
it's a pretty large pot. Uh, that plant wouldn't be two feet across, but it's pretty large. And uh, these flower, now I've had grafted brevicol, and I've had them flower more than once in a season. So it is possible, uh, but I've never managed to keep any of the brevicol on their own root um, alive for very long. Of course, we weren't potting in pumice, which we can do today. So here's the next one, and it's called Horumbans. Looks so much like, like Densiflorum. I mean, the spination is almost the same. When you look at the plants, it's totally a confusing. Uh, you cannot just identify them from the spination alone because you need the flower. Now look at the flower, how it is. It's a trumpet shaped flower. While it's a yellow, it is trumpet shaped and uh, it is a much taller flower. Here is one of the, the spineless forms. And I think the only one it could almost to be um, looked at and somebody might call it an edenia because it, it has no spines at all. When not in flower, the, the leaf can look a bit like edenia leaves and the bases are pretty large on some of these plants. So where the juvenile is concerned, the leaves are pretty large. So it's kind of like, People would find it looking a little odd as a, a denium, but as they grow up, you can see that the bases get substantial. Now, the most interesting thing about this one is it's a white flower. Now, this one will flower at a height of about a foot, a little over a foot at maturity, but if you were growing it in cultivation, uh, to get it to a foot under most conditions would still take you a good, yes, anywhere from five to eight years to get to 12 inches tall. Now these are so I'm going to call this Baroni as the king and the queen of Pachypodiums. So Baroni is uh, at once, once they used to be called Baroni Windsorii and Baroni Baronii. So now they have been elevated to species rank. So it's just Baroni and Windsori. So Pachypodium Baronii. Is that me? Okay. So there you are. It's not a very good picture, but you can see that this Baroni is uh, the only thing it looks different from an, uh, a major mature adenium is that it still has spines all along the branching, not on the trunk, but on the branching. And the leaf is really stiff compared to adenium. That's the real pretty flower. Um, they will flower at a, a height of even four inches, some of them, even earlier. They used to be a nursery in uh, Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. And they used to do an amazing job of growing these plants. Um, they were just grown so tight. So at three inches tall, they'd have a base that was almost three quarters to an inch across and they would flower at that size. So here's the Windsorii. Very slightly different, 
at the juvenile form. <clears throat> but now you can see that the much squatter and much wider base. Just look at that in habitat. Uh, just amazing. Uh, I'm not sure that any of these plants were able to make it uh, to North America, those sizes. But I was told that they were easily exported to Asia, <laughs> primarily Thailand, where there was a big market for these large plants. So here's an open atom. As you can see, the leaf is very slightly different. So on the left is, a, is something that is probably either been grown at a nursery in Madagascar, or it doesn't look as much as being field collected, but it could be. And then the juvenile has got these spination that looks like a denseflorum, but the leaf is different. Now the open atom was a much later discovery uh, with regard to pachypodiums and um, as you can see, it has a cream color leaf. Okay. What's happening? Huh? Okay. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, so all these that you're seeing, uh, they're definitely from shows and probably in California and stuff like that. All of these have come from either nurseries in Madagascar grown in, in those conditions or field collected. So you can see it's a much, it's a kind of a white, but more really on the cre uh, sometimes cream side. And they're really interesting. So remember all the other varieties of uh, these Madagascans, which look like this, have yellow flowers. And then we have Ibernium, it looks almost identical to Densiflorum, again, cream flowered. So it, its leaf is stiff. It's got the light on the underside and dark on the top a little bit, uh, but it is, the flowering is very different. So one of the things that, is makes it where you can actually find out which variety you have is by looking at the flower. There's no other way uh, for you to really identify them just looking at the spination or in some cases, the lack of spination. If you got a plant that came from somebody who, who got it from Madagascar. Now here was something that they, they called a bicolor. I don't believe it exists at all anymore. Like I have never come across this name anymore, but it was uh, a variety and it's in books. So um, I would assume that it is a name variety, but whether they've lumped it or not, or just forgotten about it, I'm not exactly sure. Now, the reason they called it bicolor because the flower had two colors. The throat of the flower was white and the petals yellow. So this almost resembles the way horumbens would grow. And um, the, the flowers look very similar except for the white throat. Now it's kind of hard that it's, I, they, they said these were the bicolors, but let me see if the flowers, like you can just see a slightly lighter throat. I mean, don't go by these pictures because these pictures are quite ancient now. They're at least 
I would probably say 20 years old, maybe uh, 15, 18, 20 years old, these pictures. So we'd probably have better pictures nowadays, but uh, I haven't come across, I haven't really been looking for them. And Drakei is another variety that they've no longer lumped much thinner leaf. Uh, the form is a slim, tall plant. And the flower uh, what is, it resembles slightly like the Horambens flower. So now we're here at Leliai. Leliai is a South African species. And uh, people used to refer to this as a Leliai, Leliai. And then there was Leliai Saundersai. Now Leliai Saunder, uh, they've been elevated to species rank. So now they're Leliai and Saundersai. While they look similar as juveniles, their growth form is completely different. So Saundersai, as it gets older, is much has just massive cordis, cortex on it and uh, stays much lower, like while the Lilia will grow more upright. So you can see that they're, they have a nice uh, cortex, but they, they grow a little bit on the taller. And that's the flower. There's a really nice dark color on the underside. It's almost like a deep pink or purple on the underside of the petal. Here's the one that most people have been able to find. It is quite common today. Not as common as some of the arborescent forms like uh, Gai and Lamarai, but uh, definitely a lot more easy to get your hands on. So you can see that it starts to widen at the base as it's getting bigger. And I actually have a plant and now it's been between Ben and myself, we've had the same plant. So I got it, it went to Ben, it came back to me. And at the base, it is over, it's probably 14 inches at the base. So I've cut it back heavily. So it's, it's not wider than probably about 20 inches, but the base alone is 14 inches. And it is just a cortex. 14 inches wide by about 12 inches tall is just the cortex. That plant is all cortex. And so there they are, the, the, the flowers. And this, these varieties prefer to flower in the fall. So most people lose the flowers because they wait uh, they don't let this plant get a little bit cool, start its dormancy, or when the flower buds start, they just keep it out a little too long and then the plant drops the flowers. So it's a tricky one to get the flower, but yes, they flower quite easily, but they prefer to flower in the fall. Now, these are the cortex types as they called it, the two codiciforms. In fact, in habitat, the cortex is all below ground. You don't see any of it. You only see the stems coming out. And uh, there are two varieties that are just amazing. Um, people have created some hybrids from these varieties, but they only, they differ slightly in the leaf. Uh, in the juveniles, it's very hard to tell the difference, but the flower is totally different. So that's a very pretty tiny little flower. And uh, 
they will flower pretty much in about a couple of years of being grown from seed if grown well. So there's the flower. And you can see that it's slightly variable, like it'll be all pink or uh, white petals with a deep colored throat, uh, more of a white petal, and some will be pink petal. Now this is succulent. It almost looks the same. What's interesting is if you grow these plants from seed, uh, you will not get the single massive cortex. You'll get multiple heavy, thick roots, uh, tuberous root, and a smaller cortex. So I have probably a succulentum that I have had for, it may be about 15 years old, but it's the the widest part of the cortex. I mean, the roots are probably now over an inch thick, each individual root, but the cortex hasn't gotten much more than two and a half inches across. Uh, I have another succulentum that I bought in the US and um, that one has a single cortex and it's over 10 inches. Yeah. I'm trying, yeah, about 10 inches across and about 10 inches tall. Uh, that's from the top of the soil. So it's, it's pretty amazing, in these plants. So you can see how they look very similar, but the one on the extreme right was grown from seed, while the other two were definitely collected. And you can see the flowers, again, that variability, uh, totally pink uh, petals and then totally white petals, but this dark stripe is really interesting. And the sizes uh, of the flower are different. So I, I'm not sure that I have Griquincy over here, but if there was a variety that they called Griquincy. And the reason they called it Griquincy is the flower size was much smaller, uh, but grew very much like succulent and the flowers are identical. Uh, and it was supposed to be a smaller version, but um, nowadays you don't hear any reference to it. Ambogans, this is a really interesting one. So people uh, look at this and they would say, this is a Lamari uh, seedling, but in fact, it is totally different. This, one, this plant will flower at about a height of maybe 18 inches, give or take, depends how, how it's grown. It would almost look like Lamari, but once it flowers, it will start to branch your average Lamari and Gai will not flower till they're at least about six feet tall. That's early if you can get them to flower. And most people will never get them to flower because they're bringing them into the house where the light conditions are not great and then taking them out in summer. So they take longer to mature. So there's the Ambergans and it's uh, really beautiful. Now, it was interesting that Ambergans was a CITES 1. I don't know what it, what, well, where it appears now, but at one point, this was under CITES 1. That is the end.